thank you all for being here. I'm Crosby Kemper, the uh, director of the Kansas City Public Library. I just want to make sure we've got the Confederates on this side, the unions on this side. Okay, just so, just so we're, 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 we're clear about that. Um, I do want to mention a, a couple of upcoming programs. Uh, in particular, since this uh, is uh, uh, related to our uh, Hail to the Ch is part of our Hail to the Chief series, uh, which I'll mention a little bit more, the partnership with the Truman Library uh, in a second. I do want to make sure that you know that, that we have uh, another in that uh, uh, series, uh, an, the new series that we're building on top of the Hail to the Chief series, the Beyond the Gown series about the First Ladies, uh, towards the, uh, at the beginning of April, April 3rd, uh, here at the Plaza, uh, also in conjunction with the Truman Library. Um, and Henry Adams will be talking about his great, 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 I think, grandmother, Abigail Adams. Uh, Henry, uh, many of you will know, was a curator at the, at the Nelson uh, and at the Kemper, uh, author of biographies of uh, Thomas Hart Benton, Thomas Aikens, and uh, Thomas Hart Benton and Jackson Pollock and their relationship, et cetera. Uh, anyway, Henry's been in the library a number of times before. He's a wonderful lecturer, and he'll be talking about uh, a woman who certainly uh, ranks among the, uh, the most important first ladies, the most important women, the most one of one of the uh, uh, not not forgotten founders of uh, of our country. Anyway, that's April third. Um, I also want to mention we have uh, a couple of important programs uh, coming up uh, that are important. I think about the future of the uh, the city. We're doing a. Uh, a, a program with the Citizens Association on the uh, on local control of the uh, uh, the police department in April, and uh, we're the only city left, the only large city left in the United States that does not have local control of the police department. Whether or not that is an important issue or not is what we'll be talking about, uh, and if it is, why. Uh, why it is. Uh, we'll also have, and, and uh, uh, in uh, this month, we'll, we'll have all the former chiefs, the living former chiefs of police uh, uh, here at the Central Library on March 26th. Um, we have a, a great exhibit of uh, the history of the police department uh, at the Central Library. And on top of that, I'll be conducting with the uh, former chiefs, uh, uh, Joseph McNamara, Jim, uh, Jim Corwin, uh, Richard Easley, and our current chief, Daryl Forte, uh, uh, a, a conversation uh, about the police department. That should be pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Um, so we've got, got a lot of uh, wonderful things uh, coming up uh, that I think are, uh, are, are worth your attention. If you're not uh, members of the uh, Friends of the Library or not on our mailing list, please, uh, you, you can sign up uh, out at the desk uh, halfway down the hall, uh, and uh, we would be happy to be sending you emails about our, our programming. I do want to mention um, the, uh, the importance of the uh, the partnership that we're in. It's a partnership really uh, of more than one uh, institution. Uh, our Hail to the Chiefs and our Beyond the Gowns and many other programs that we do. The Truman Library Book Award, uh, for instance, which is given every two years that uh, we partner uh, with the Truman Library Institute and the Truman Presidential Library. Um, I, I want to thank them for being a great partner. Uh, Mary Hunkler, who is the chairman of the board, is here. Mike Devine, who's the director of the Presidential Library. Uh, Alex Burden, who uh, is the director of the Truman Library Institute. Now, Mike did tell me um, earlier that he is spending almost all of his time uh, writing reports uh, on the sequestration, um, the sequester. and. And, and about, he's writing reports about what the library cannot do. And I told him, I thought it would be very important for him to write a report to Washington uh, and say that the first thing that he can't do is write a report on the sequestration and then just stop there. <laughs> he thought that was a great idea. Actually, I think he's out drinking now, but uh, uh, <laughs> after I told him that. I'm um, also the president of our board, uh, who's been instrumental in the partnership. Uh, Jonathan Kemper is here. Uh, Jonathan, no relation, at least this week. Um, <laughs> Jonathan is here. And uh, uh, so it, this is a great partnership, and the partnership has been uh, funded and supported uh, and guided uh, to some extent by the Kauffman Foundation. Uh, this uh, forum, the Truman Forum, our, our great auditorium here, uh, uh, partly paid for by Kauffman and the relationship uh, and, and our programming uh, substantially paid for by Kaufman. So we're very grateful to the Kaufman Foundation for that. Uh, tonight we are, we're honored to have uh, not only one of Amer America's great journalists, 
uh, David Vandrelli, uh, who uh, has written 160 stories for Time magazine over the years, including a number of uh, cover stories. Uh, David, David has uh, won a number of journalism uh, awards over the years. A great narrative historian, uh, his book on the Triangle Fire uh, is one of the great uh, narrative histories of an event, uh, 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 an American event. Uh, indeed, uh, he, uh, uh, he got called by one uh, reviewer uh, 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 after the Triangle uh, Fire book, uh, the master of disaster. Um, <laughs> And uh, it probably, probably has had to resist. I heard David McCullough in New Haven about 10 days ago talking about his writing career. And his first book was about the Johnstown flood. And he, he, he said, you know, it took him a long time to, uh, uh, to convince uh, publishers and, uh, and, and, and magazines and others to, to keep from sending him proposals about writing disaster books. Uh, and he was afraid of getting typed. And David could have been typed. Uh, but he hasn't. He remains a great journalist. He's written uh, uh, some uh, uh, some fascinating and controversial stories. A cover story on on Glenn Beck called "Madman" uh, for Time uh, that that you might have seen. Um, he's won uh, the American Bar Association Silver Gavel Award, uh, the American Society of News Editors Distinguished Writing Award. Um, uh, he, he takes journalism so seriously that he married Karen Ball, who is the White House correspondent for the New York Daily News. Um, and uh, they have four. They have four children. Uh, and, and and but he's also a, a local boy. He's a Kansas City, and the family lives here in, in Kansas City now. And and that may explain why uh, Lincoln, the rise to greatness. One of the great strengths of the rise to greatness is, which is about the year 1862, is that that David, unlike a lot of Civil War historians, understands the importance of the West, the importance of our part of the country. Um, he, he talks talks about uh, what I think is the most underrated uh, uh, battle for its importance in the history of the Civil War, the uh, the capture by General Grant of uh, Forts Henry and Donelson, um, at, with uh, boats created in St. Louis by uh, James Eads, Eads Bridge uh, fame, the turtle boats, et cetera. Um, uh, he understands he understands the importance of the West in the in the history of the Civil War, and, and the book uh, is it, ha, has that as one of its uh, underlying uh, themes. It's it's great narrative history, and he tells he tells great stories, but with a great arc understanding. I won't I won't uh, I won't reveal the ending of the book, <laughs> but there is a there is there is a narrative story really with a beginning and, and an end from New Year's Day uh, to New Year's Day. Uh, uh, 1862 to 18, January 1st, 1860, 1863. Um, I mentioned Henry Adams before, and Abigail Adams, uh, Charles Francis Adams plays, uh, uh, who is Henry's great great grandfather, um, uh, plays a plays a major role in this in keeping the uh, the Europeans out of the Civil War. Um, but it's also the kind of narrative history that not only has the grand arc of great battles, Antietam. Uh, the bloodiest day in the history of the, the Civil War, uh, but also the importance of, of the coincidental, uh, the small things, the for want of a nail things. Cigars, as always, in my view, in history, uh, play a great role in this story. I won't, I won't tell that story, let David tell that story. Uh, but uh, he's, the book has made justly some top 10 lists. It's, it's, uh, historians are now beginning to turn out because we're in lots of Civil War and Lincoln anniversaries, obviously turn out these great lists of uh, you know the 100 best books on Lincoln, the 10 best books on Lincoln. And needless to say, uh, uh, if you've read this book, uh, David Vondrelli is appearing on all of those lists. So it's an honor for the Kansas City Public Library to welcome David Vondrelli. Thank you. Wow, what a, what a thrill to find this big crowd uh, in my adopted hometown of Kansas City. Karen and I have lived here for five and a half years now. And I must say, when we moved here, uh, even though I grew up just on the other side of the big empty, as I call it, in Denver, Colorado, uh, <laughs> and, and made that long uh, trip across I-70 several times in my youth, I didn't really know what to expect from Kansas City when we moved here from Washington, D.C. And I, 
I must say I've been overwhelmed by the, the welcome and support and, and uh, fun times that we've had in this beautiful city. And this is a, another addition to the great memories that I'm collecting in this place that has become home. I want to thank uh, Crosby Kemper and Henry Fortunato for uh, inviting me to do this. Uh, uh, my friends at the Truman Library, Mike and Alex, friend to be, Mary, my friend as of tonight uh, at the great Truman Library. I often think, especially after visiting a couple of times over at the museum in Independence and seeing uh, compressed into those first years of the Truman administration, the astonishing world-changing events that this man from Jackson County uh, presided over. I, th I think in many ways he is the 20th century version of the man I want to talk about tonight, Abraham Lincoln. And Charles Sumner, near the beginning of 1862, the great abolitionist and Massachusetts senator said, uh, never in history has so much been all compressed into so little time. And uh, Harry Truman had that same experience uh, and was equally underestimated and, like Lincoln, rose to greatness in the office. Uh, I want to talk a little bit uh, tonight about this year, 1862, and about this uh, strange man, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I hope I don't offend anyone by calling our arguably our greatest president, a strange man, but that's the word he used for himself. Uh, he was the first one to say. In one of his earliest little bits of autobiography, he described himself as a strange, friendless, penniless boy when he emerged from the frontier and began his life in Illinois. And when he reached uh, Washington, D.C., uh, he was equally strange to the people who met him there. It began with the physical appearance of Lincoln, a very oddly put together uh, piece of a person. He, he seemed to be made up of uh, pieces borrowed from other human beings. His, his torso, actually, uh, we all know that he's our tallest president at, at about my height, six foot four. Uh, but his torso was uh, the size of a, of a normal uh, man of his time, you know, at more like five foot nine. It was these extraordinarily long legs that he had and equally long arms that dangled, huge hands and feet. Uh, he was, his nickname among people who didn't like him in Washington, and there were an awful lot of them, was the gorilla or as Edwin Stanton called him when he met him in the 1850s. Stanton, of course, became one of Lincoln's greatest admirers and supporters. Uh, it was Stanton who said at Lincoln's deathbed, now he belongs to the ages. But when Stanton first met him in the 1850s, when they were lawyers together on a patent case in Chicago, he called him that damned long-armed ape. They didn't really know what to make of him in Washington. His Secretary of State, William Seward, at the beginning of the Lincoln administration, was nice enough to offer to essentially take over the presidency for Lincoln. It was obvious that he was overmatched and not up to the job. Lincoln uh, declined to, to give Seward that job. But in those first months of the Civil War, uh, everything about the United States changed almost overnight. The scale of the transformation of the federal government between April of 1861 and December of, uh, or January, New Year's Day, 1862, where my book begins, is simply mind-boggling. The entire budget for the presidential executive staff when Abraham Lincoln came to Washington was one employee. He was allowed to bring uh, hire a secretary. 
He immediately knew he'd need at least two secretaries, so he stashed one on the, on the Interior Department payroll until he could get a supplemental appropriation for John Hay's salary. The entire federal budget was about $70 million. That had been the appropriation for 1861 fiscal year when Congress, the last Congress before secession, had met. By the beginning of 1862, the federal government was spending $70 million every week, 50 times. We worry about the growth of the federal government now. I mean, 50 times bigger is uh, frightening to contemplate. The Union Army, at the beginning of Lincoln's presidency, numbered about 16,000 troops spread out all across the continent, most of them out in the West in little garrisons of 50 or 100 or 200 men keeping the peace here or there. At the outset of the war, there was no one in the Union Army or the United States Army under the age of 60 who had ever led more than 1,000 troops in battle. The men who were being called on to command the enormous overnight volunteer army being created to put down the rebellion in the South, these men, uh, their combat experience was as 20-year-olds, young West Point graduates in the Mexican-American War 15 years earlier. They had been lieutenants lieutenants leading companies of a few dozen men, perhaps. This was their experience. In October of 1861, one of those men who had had a very, very good uh, tour in the Mexican War had been promoted to captain uh, based on his success. Very promising young officer who had left the army and gone into private life, had been brought back to uh, helped train these troops that were being raised, the volunteers in Illinois. He had been offered the command of a regiment, which is a thousand men. And he wrote in a letter, I don't think there are many men on this continent who are qualified to lead a thousand men, and I'm sure I'm not one of them. That was Ulysses Grant, who by February of 1862 was leading 17,000 men, and by April was in command of 50,000 men, and by the end of the year was in command of 100,000 troops. This army of 16,000 in April of 1861, by the end of 1861, had grown to some quarter of a million troops spread across the line from Washington, from the Washington area out here to St. Louis. Who was going to lead these troops? And people looked at this strange figure, this ungainly ape of a president whose entire executive experience was as senior partner in a two-man law firm in Springfield, Illinois, a two-man law firm that the junior partner actually ran from day to day. They looked at him and they felt he was entirely out of his depth. Nothing illustrates this better than the meeting that was held at the White House on New Year's Eve in the last hours of 1861 as 1862 was about to begin. Congress, which had been out for most of the year, had reconvened at the beginning of December. One of the first things they did was to look around at this wreck that the Lincoln administration was making of the war. Armies were stalled all across the Union line. Nothing was moving, nothing seemed to be happening. The War Department was a corrupt shambles. So Congress appointed an oversight committee, the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War, 
And the members of the committee had asked for a meeting with Lincoln and his cabinet, and now it was happening on New Year's Eve. For over 90 minutes, the Congressional Committee interrogated Lincoln. And the more questions they asked, the clearer it became that Abraham Lincoln really had no idea what this Union Army was planning. The commander of the armies, the general-in-chief, a 34-year-old named George McClellan, another one of these Mexican-American veterans who had gone into private life and had been called back, a former captain like Grant. The only thing he and Grant did not have in common was that McClellan had no doubt that he was qualified to command <laughs> any number of troops that could be raised. McClellan had completely frozen Lincoln out of his plans. And worse, McClellan was suffering from typhoid fever, and the rumor that night around Washington was that he was dying. And that whatever plans he was cooking up were about to die with him. This shocking revelation of the the lack of knowledge on the part of the commander-in-chief was so demoralizing that everybody uh, left in a funk. The Attorney General, Edward Bates, a lawyer from St. Louis, went home and sat up into the night writing page after page in his diary, trying to get it all down. The rudderlessness, the fecklessness. He finally sums up his conclusions about Abraham Lincoln. He says he seems to be a man of character, uh, honest, in the main, wise. I like that little caveat, in the main, wise. But he lacks force and will and has not the power to command. This was Abraham Lincoln at the beginning of 1862. And what unfolded over the next 12 months was what I call America's most perilous year, the hinge of American history, the year when the Confederacy came closest to winning its independence and breaking up the United States. It was a year of tremendous personal struggle for Lincoln. His favorite son, Willie, died of typhoid fever at age 11 in February. His wife suffered a nervous breakdown from the grief, locked herself in her room for over a month, didn't come out. His youngest son had lost his best friend and playmate and now was basically alone in Washington, D.C. And Lincoln was the only person who could provide love and care for Tad. The grief overwhelmed him for the entire year. And what else was going on in this year? This was the year that the Civil War became a cataclysm. No one, as Lincoln said in his great second inaugural address, no one at the beginning of the war imagined what it was going to be. On both sides, people believed there would be some kind of easy resolution, some quick victory. Either the Europeans would intervene on the side of the Confederacy and force a resolution, or the, on the North they believed that there'd be a victory or two by this great Union army that had been raised, this, ar this, this uh, mass of stout volunteers and the people of the South would come to their senses and realize they had much more to gain by staying in the Union than by breaking it up. No one imagined until the first weekend of April, 1862, at a steamboat landing in southern Tennessee near the Mississippi border by a little church called Shiloh. In two days, April 6th and 7th, Saturday and Sunday, 
There was a battle at Shiloh that left more Americans dead than had died in all of the nation's wars put together up to that point. This was carnage on a scale that Americans had never seen or imagined. And then just a few weeks after that, in the Seven Days Battles outside Richmond, it happened again. Thousands of young men killed and maimed in a single 90 minutes or so on the afternoon of July 3rd at Malvern Hill outside Richmond. I believe it's 3,000 Confederate troops killed in a hopeless assault on a Union artillery position. It happened again at the Second Battle of Bull Run at the end of August, and it happened again, as Crosby noted, on September 17th in Western Maryland at Antietam Creek. In a single day, more Americans killed than on any other day in our history, all the way up to today. 23,000 men dead, wounded, and missing in the Battle of Antietam. And even then, the Battle of Perryville, called the most confused and desperate three hours of the war by some. The Battle of Fredericksburg in December, the reverse image of Malvern Hill, this time it was Union troops in a hopeless assault on a Confederate position. And as the year ended, on New Year's Eve 1862, at Murfreesboro in central Tennessee, the battle that uh, cost the Union Army the highest percentage losses of the entire war. A third of the Union Army lost in the, what became a victory at Stones River. So, through this whole year, Lincoln was wrestling with the competing demands of conservatives who uh, wanted him to move carefully, who sought some kind of negotiated, peaceful end to the war. And on the other side, the abolitionists who were constantly pressing him to make the war uh, a true war against slavery. He said at the beginning of the year that if I can just hold the North together, we can win. But holding the North together was a tremendous battle for this man. Remember, Abraham Lincoln was elected in 1862 with the smallest percentage of the popular vote in our history. He was, in that sense, the least popular president at the start of his administration that we've ever had. Six, more than six out of 10 Americans voted against him. He got 37% of the vote. But how was he to hold this union together? He compared himself at one point during 1862 to a man crossing Niagara Falls on a tightrope, where one false step in either direction would plunge him into the abyss. And all the while, he said, there are people on the other shore yelling, take a step to the right, <laughs> a step to the left. Why couldn't they just understand that he had all the hopes and dreams of the United States on his back and that it would all go with him? Somehow, oh, well, let me. I, I, I know that many of us were taught in school that the outcome of the Civil War really was an inevitability. The North had so many more men, so many more railroads, so many more factories, so many more farms, so many more crops. 
That's not how it looked at the beginning of 1862. The most experienced statesmen in the world were convinced that the North would not win this fight. Lord Palmerston, the 77-year-old Prime Minister of Great Britain, having spent 50 years at the top of the most powerful government in the world, he informed his foreign ministry that it was his judgment that almost inevitably the North would fail to subdue the South. Why was that? Well, first, the, the real estate involved. The Confederacy was larger than the entire European continent conquered by Napoleon. What's more, it was almost impenetrable in so many ways. There were only a couple of railroads that ran from the north to the south. There were virtually no highways. It was all dirt roads, sandy in the summer, muddy in the winter. Fortunately for the north, there were rivers like the Mississippi, the Tennessee and the Cumberland that uh, Grant exploited in his great Fort Donelson campaign that Crosby talked about. But the South was also tremendously wealthy in very important ways. They had a near monopoly, a virtual monopoly on the world's most valuable commodity in 1860s, cotton. The Industrial Revolution in Europe was being driven by the textile industry, and the textile industry was hungry, starving for cotton. The South was convinced that by cutting off the supply of cotton to England and France, they could force the Europeans to intervene in this matter and uh, demand a settlement that would recognize Southern independence. The task seemed uh, almost impossible even to many people in the United States, in the North. And what they were quite sure of at the beginning of 1862 was that if somebody was going to be able to master this situation, it was not going to be this frontier lawyer, this elected character. They'd all studied their history and they knew that all the elected republics in history the, uh, that had come into uh, great crises like this, they had all been forced to turn to a military dictator. Rome had to turn to Caesar. France turned to Napoleon. They were convinced that there would have to be a military coup, a dictator of some sort set up above Lincoln, over Lincoln, in order to get the kind of things done that would be necessary to win this war and defeat this enemy. Some thought it would be McClellan. They spent all year whispering in McClellan's ear, telling him to turn his army around and take it to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Folks out here in Missouri thought it might be John Fremont who was known to be negotiating and discussing and planning his own little empire west of the Mississippi. But whoever it was, it wasn't going to be Abraham Lincoln. And yet, and yet, by the time the calendar had come all the way around, and New Year's Day, 1863 arrived, Lincoln had command of the military. He had relieved McClellan. He had successfully kept the Europeans out of the war. The great southern invasion of the North that took place in September and October of 1862 had failed. The elections of 1862 had passed and Lincoln's Republican Party was still in power. 
And most importantly, Lincoln, on New Year's Day, 1863, signed the Emancipation Proclamation. It changed the face of the war and the future of the country. It took the first steps toward the new birth of freedom that he would speak of later that year at Gettysburg. Now, how he did this, how he got from our lowest New Year's Day to arguably our proudest New Year's Day is a really, it's a great story. I hope I've given you that sense. But it is a story that takes 380 pages to tell. <laughs> so I can't, I'll leave it at that. But I do want to talk just a minute about a question that I often got and still do get in, when I would talk about this book. It's the one that I think really nags at us as a country. It's a simple question. Why? It's one thing to learn how he rose to greatness, but why did he fight this war? Why not let the South go? Why fight a war that cost, historians now believe, some 750,000 lives in a country of 30 million people? A war that decimated the southern economy. By some estimates I read recently, it is only in our time, only in the past 20 years, that the South has return to the level of wealth and prosperity that it had in 1860. It took him 100, almost 150 years. And to tell that story, to answer that question, we have to go back even further than 1862, another 53 years, to 1809, February 12th, a chilly Sunday, in the remote hills of northern Kentucky, a little hut on a hillside. They call it a log cabin. That's a little glamorous, really. It was a hut. There were logs filled together with mud. The entire space was less than 100 square feet. The room was smoky from this chimney that didn't draw very well. Abraham Lincoln's mother took her life in her hands by giving birth. There was no medical care. The stories are that the family sent for the old granny woman who lived about 10 miles away. She got there after the baby was born. He'd already been washed in water that was hauled from a dripping spring below the house wrapped up in animal skins and laid on a bed of dry husks over a mud floor. The point of telling that story is that though the calendar said 1809, the conditions into which Abraham Lincoln was born were no different than if he had been born a thousand years earlier or 10,000 years earlier for that matter. And as he grew up, he came to understand that the desperate, desperate poverty into which he was born had for thousands and thousands of years been a prison from which there was no escape. In all the societies that had been invented and created up until his day, to be born poor fated you to die poor. A few were born to be rich, and the rest were fated to be poor forever. But he had been born some 20 years after the creation of the United States, a nation founded on the ideal that all people were created equal and endowed with the right to make of themselves what they could, what one great Lincoln historian has called the right to rise in the world. He understood that this idea was the key to the prison of poverty. 
And as he grew, he came to understand that the opposite system that did exist in the United States, the slave system, which faded a few to be wealthy forever and many more to be poor forever, was a complete repudiation of the ideals of the Declaration. He understood that until this issue was resolved, the United States would not, could not be what it was, what it might possibly be, that a house divided against itself, as he said famously, couldn't and wouldn't stand. And he, like a lot of people in 1862, understood something that we have forgotten. That if the South was successful in breaking away from the North, if secession as an ideal, a principle was vindicated, there would be no end to it. The North-South divide was not the only divide in the United States then, or you might say now. Folks out here in the Midwest, their commercial ties were down the Mississippi River to New Orleans with the South. That's how they got their crops and their products to market. They had no interest and no affinity for the prigs of New England, as they thought of them. The people of New York, they were building New York City into one of the world's great financial hubs. How? By financing the cotton trade. Their interests were with the South. They were already talking about seceding from the North and setting up as a free port of New York. What about out in the West? these new states of California and Oregon, these treasure troves, they were connected to the Union in the East by wagon ruts. It was 1862, this same year, when the Transcontinental Railroad was authorized. But in those days, it was still a three-month trip around Cape Horn to get from New York to San Francisco. That, they weren't tied to the Union. And they were talking about secession out there. What about the South? The Confederacy was no more stable than the North was. I mean, they had Texas in the Confederacy. Texas has always wanted to be its own country. <laughs> then, now, and forever. <laughs> what Lincoln saw was that if the South was able to, to secede, that the fate of this dream of a peaceful nation from sea to shining sea, of the opportunity to rise in the world, this key to the prison of poverty, would be fated to break up into another version of Europe, a little kingdom here, a principality there, a democracy over here, a republic there, constantly fighting, constantly in competition, constantly at war. And so at the end of 1862, as November turned to December, Lincoln was trying to hold his party together after a difficult off-year election. He had the largest Native American uprising in our history. Uh, blazing away in Minnesota. He was worried about the Union Army uh, being led in a coup when he had decided to finally to fire McClellan. He had these terrible battles piling up one on top of another. The front pages of the newspapers filled with lists of the dead. With all this going on, he locked himself in his office for most of a week to prepare his annual message to Congress. It's a strange document. I participated in an argument not long ago with uh, a number of Lincoln scholars, and 
they were using words like bizarre, deranged, uh, inexplicable. I finally had to speak up for this document. It is strange. No other president could possibly have produced it. But it was Lincoln's explanation to the American people of why they had to do this and what was in it for the country. He was this man on the tightrope crossing over Niagara, but he asked people to look at the other side. Where were they going? He talked about the geography of North America, how it was perfectly set up for one country and not well designed for more than one. He talked about the demography of the United States, the rate at which it was growing and renewing itself, attracting talent and hard work from all around the world. He talked about the natural resources that had been discovered on this continent, the richest breadbasket in the world, these gold and silver mines, these vast timber forests. And he said, look with me out 70 years. It's an amazing thing. I don't know of any other president who has done this. It's not talking about what he wants to do this year, or this term, or in his next term, or for the children. He's saying, look out 70 years. If we can hold this country together, if we can get through this trial, if we can wage the hard, desperate fight, as he said, that it will require to win this struggle. In 70 years, the United States can be more prosperous than all of Europe put together. An extraordinary thing to say at a time when the sun never set on the British Empire, when the French Empire extended from Asia to Latin America, when Belgium controlled much of Africa, when Portugal and Spain still had their Remnant empires, when the Russian Empire was seen as one of the great rising forces of the world, the idea that this one country could be richer, more successful, more powerful, more prosperous than all of Europe put together. And guess what? He missed by about 10 years. An extraordinary visionary moment. He said, we shall nobly win or meanly lose the last best hope of earth. That's why he fought the Civil War. That's why we venerate him now, if we do, as our greatest president. And that's why that vision, along with his many other skills, his great political cunning, his great patience, his great imperviousness to criticism, his great ability to learn. But this vision is why he is our greatest president. I thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to have your questions. <laughs>